Well, we are, of course, talking about England's World Cup win in the cricket. We have Lawrence Booth with us, cricket uh, writer for the Daily Mail. Evening, Lawrence. Hello, Jack. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, there's a, you know, a bit of billion ways in which this was utterly bananas at the end. I'm not sure which is the most bananas way. Maybe you want to give us your own personal highlight. Well, it was just unbelievable. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were hanging on in the, uh, in the, in the media centre there. We were told the next day that in the Daily Mail we'd have a, a special pull-out of England won, a 12-page cricket pull-out, but if we didn't, there'd be no pull-out. So everyone, we'd written hundreds and hundreds of words, weren't sure whether they were going to be used, and uh, thankfully they were, because, um, I mean, where do you begin? Do you, do, you, do you look at the Stokes, sort of the, the, the ricochet that went for six and should have been five? Do you look at Trent Bolt taking that catch on the boundary when he, he put his foot on the rope? Do you look at the... Uh, the, the, the super over when um, Jimmy Neesham pulled Joffre Archer for six and he thought it was New Zealand's or or do you look at Jason Roy's throw to beat Martin Guptill diving back to the second it was just uh, a once in a lifetime cricket match and a privilege to be there Lawrence I don't watch cricket all that often I must confess Are you, the Stokes ricochet uh, so there yeah. is the there is the the um, officials getting the rule wrong, which is quite extraordinary given the um, level of cricket we're talking about here. How often does a ricochet like that happen? Almost never. I mean, the, the, the reason the, the umpires got the, the, got the law wrong, and partly it was the, the pressure of the moment, and they had a, a, you know, dozens of other things to check in that instant, but also partly because law, and it's 19.8, as I'm sure you know, yeah. out of 42 laws in, um, in the <laughs> MCC's law, but it's, it's so little known and so little used that uh, probably as they read the, the law of the umpires and get to know them, they just skipped over that bit. I mean, the, it, it, it was incredible, really. No one in the, in the room knew. It wasn't until a sharp-eyed reporter actually bothered to look at the laws later on that he discovered, discovered that, hang on, maybe a mistake had been made here, by which time, of course, it was, it was too late. It was dreadful luck uh, for New Zealand. It's very true, because none of the New Zealand players were over to the referees to say, well, do you not know Law 19.8? No, precisely. I mean, they, they, their initial feeling, it seemed, was, should the ball have been called dead because it came off Stokes's bat? You know, did, did the play stop there? But because Stokes hadn't deliberately run in the line of the ball, I mean, if you, if you watch the replay, he just dives like a madman for the crease, hoping to get back for two, and the ball hit, happens to hit his bat and then disappears to the boundary one, with one of the New Zealand fielders chasing after it like his life depended upon it. Mm. Um, no, you know, no one knew the law, and they they had to get on with the game. So, of course, you know, you, you could argue that if England had only been given five rather than six, they'd have played the last two balls differently. Well, of course, they would have done. But, and we'll never know how it would have panned out, but it was a, a critical moment and, a, and an awful piece of luck for the Kiwis. In terms of excitement, this game was obviously extraordinary, especially the finale. What about in terms of quality, Lawrence? Will this be remembered as a great game, a great standard game? Well, I think the excitement of the finale kind of trumped all other considerations. Um, you know, the, the, it wasn't a great pitch, uh, perhaps people have been hoping for a, a sort of a, a great Lord's wicket where the team batting first scored 330 and the team batting second got close. So it was it was a low-scoring affair. But that, you know, sometimes these cagey, uh, low-scoring one-day internationals can be just as gripping. I mean, the tension was like nothing I'd ever felt probably since the 2005 Ashes. Um, and, of course, England won, won that 2-1, having not won the Ashes for 19 years. Mm. Um, yeah, so you could argue it wasn't the highest quality, but for tension, it will. I, I'm not sure it will ever be beaten. Were you expecting England to win the World Cup at the outset? Um, uh, yeah, we in the mail we all had to choose our, we had to predict a winner, and and I I did say England. Um, I wasn't entirely confident, only because I, I expected them to get to the semi-finals, no problem. You know, the top four from the group of ten went through, but once you get to the semis, it's it's a bit of a lottery. You can have mm. a bad day and lose to Australia and New Zealand in the semi-final, and suddenly you're out. Four years of, of hard work counts for nothing. But when they did get to the semi-finals, eventually it was on the back of a bit of a fight back. They beat India and New Zealand in the group stages, two games they had to win after losing to Sri Lanka and Australia. Uh, and then, so the momentum was with them a bit, and they, they thrashed Australia in the semi-final. And I thought they'd win the final, not not in the circumstances they did. It was much tighter, and in fact, for a lot of the game, it looked like New Zealand would win. So, look, they they got all the luck in the world in that final. Don't mm. you know, don't underestimate that. But they've They've come through and they can always say they're world champions now. They sure can. That 2005 Ashes series was um, just so gripping and a, a high watermark. And I think in 2011, England were the number one ranked team in the world yep. as well. The fortunes of English cricket from 2011 to this point, because it's been very up and down, you might just briefly chart out the journey. 
Yeah, it has been up and down. You're right. They topped the the test rankings in 2011. Um, a film's just come out about that, and but also about the subsequent decline, which happened quite quickly. They they lost the Ashes in Australia five 0 in in 2013 14. Kevin Peterson was sort of scapegoated for that defeat, kicked out. There was a lot of change and turmoil. Uh, they won, you know, an Ashes home series in, in 2015, but the, the Test team really has taken second place to the fortunes of the the, the the 50 overside in the last four years. England were hopeless at the 2015 World Cup, um, and Andrew Strauss, who was the managing director of the England team at the time, decided to prioritise white ball cricket, which is something that had never happened in English cricket. Test cricket had always been the the, the, the format that was considered most important. So that changed things, and suddenly they were building up to a World Cup. They were went top of the one-day rankings last year, stayed there, uh, and became the team to beat. Now, look, the, the Test team will be back in action. They're playing Ireland next week, mm. or the four-day game at Lords, followed by a five-game uh, five Ashes series. So very quickly, you move on to the next uh, thing. And, you know, if England can make it a World Cup Ashes double, it'll be like a summer, uh, they, you know, totally unprecedented. Was that a contentious um, move on Strauss's part to move away from prioritising Test match cricket? Because I would have thought um, certainly the traditionalists and maybe beyond, like that's the um, the, the the kind of the, the the true game, you know, that, the, the kind of sacrilege to move away from that. Yeah, there, there was a, there were a few grumbles, but I but I also think people were fed up with England being a laughing stock at, at, at World Cups every four years. You know, yeah. that that's when the rest of the world saw their one day side, and they just couldn't quite believe that England were playing this old fashioned style of cricket. So. There was a certain relief in English cricket circles that they finally decided to take 50 over cricket seriously, and you know Owen Morgan was a big part of that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they didn't completely ne- neglect Test cricket. You know, they won some series in between. They just weren't quite as consistent as they'd been a few years earlier. And because the one-day side was doing so well, people were able to give that the, the Test team a bit more leeway. In the midst of all this, there was also the appointment of Trevor Bayliss as coach. He's 42 years of age now. He has advocated this attacking, expressive style of play. That, 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 that's been one of the big changes, too. Yeah, he took over sort of midway through 2015, um, and Andrew Strauss appointed him because he felt he was a, a calm kind of coach. His predecessor, Peter Moores, was famously described by Kevin Peterson as a, as a woodpecker. He kept on going at the players and didn't give them any respite. Um, Bayless was the exact opposite, and actually... You know, while Bayliss has been important in allowing the players to go out and express themselves, Morgan has actually been the guy who's who put that philosophy into place, and Bayliss has, has let him get on with it. He's a very hands-off kind of coach. He lets the players take responsibility, and that that's been you know the, the, the success of that policy has been reflected um, well, was reflected on Sunday. As you might imagine, we're all very interested in Owen Morgan. That's kind of yeah. I, I suspect we wouldn't be talking right now, uh, really, if he hadn't been <laughs> the captain in 2010. Morgan told the Sunday Times from the age of 13. I wanted to play cricket for England. I never felt any shame in saying this and that that was what I wanted to do. And the people at home involved in cricket, they were like, fair play, it's going to be unbelievable if you make it. And we understand the reasons why he went. He wanted to play cricket at the highest level. So uh, the impact Morgan has made, because I, I, you know, again, I'm just looking through his career and I'm seeing 16 test matches, an average batting of 30, but he's played 210 one-day internationals for England. He's been captain for four years. So it would be a mistake to look at his uh, test match uh, appearance number and, and deduce that he was some kind of failure in that and that he had to settle for one-day internationals, given what you've said about the direction of English cricket generally? Oh, oh for sure. I mean, you know, the test career ended several years ago and uh, as, you, as you sort of allude to, they're not, not very successfully, although some guys coming in the team now would probably kill for an average of 30, but it was, yeah. it was decided, um, you know, after that, that, that white ball cricket was the way forward for him. He was given a a hospital pass really ahead of the last World Cup. They sacked Alistair Cook only a few weeks before mm. the 2015 World Cup, a terrible piece of planning. And Morgan was given a side that wasn't really his, and they certainly weren't able to play with the, the panache that he's, he's instilled in them. He's been utterly central to everything they've done. He's backed them all the way. Every, every utterance has been consistent with his idea that England have to attack. That That is England's strength. Right. Uh, you know, even if they were bowled out with five overs to go over one day international, the old the old school approach would have been, oh, you've got to bat out your 50 overs. Morgan, Morgan's view was no, rubbish. We had to go for it. And if we get bowled out occasionally going for it, we'll win more games uh, than we lose. So, look, he's now, there, there are three, you know, you talk of Bobby Moore winning the 1966 Football World Cup, Martin Johnson, the 2003 Rugby World Cup. Well, Owen Morgan can join that that pantheon of, of, of England World Cup winning captains. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a huge moment for him, and he'll always have that on his CV. 
Were there any misgivings or grumblings about an Irishman captaining the English cricket team? Oh, there always are in England. I mean, you, you know, you're always going to get that kind of slightly um, insular, insular right-wing perspective. Um, but, but importantly, among the people that mattered, there weren't any grumbling. Um, they could see Morgan for, for what he was, which was an incredibly clear-eyed, cool guy. He knew what he wanted, and, they, and, and the authorities gave him the, the, the tools to, to, to carry out his plan. So there was, no, there was no one on Sunday when he lifted the trophy saying, isn't it embarrassing that an Irishman is lifting the World Cup for England? Absolutely not. He feels he feels very much a part of a what is a diverse English team. You know, we Joffrey Archer was born in Barbados. Jason Roy was born in South Africa. Ben Stokes in New Zealand. Um, Moen Ali and Adil Rashid are British-born Muslims. The Owen Morgan actually said oh, in the press conference on the night of victory that Adil Rashid had said Ad Allah was with us today, mm. and he and he said it without without a it, it wasn't a joke. It mm. was it was a reflection of the fact that England, the English cricket team, has always been this diverse. Hotchpotch really of different cultures and nationalities, and finally they're not embarrassed to admit it. They they felt that they're very proud of that uh, diversity. Yeah, somebody might mention that to Jacob Rees Mogg. We have that clip actually, <laughs> if you want, of uh, here for people who didn't hear it. It might be just interesting to hear Morgan's response because it was quite impressive actually uh, in the moment when you consider all things. Have a listen. You think the lack of an Irishman got England over the line? <laughs> We had Allah with us as well. I spoke to Adil. He said Allah was definitely with us. And I said we had the rub of the green. Actually epitomises our team. It's quite diverse backgrounds and cultures and guys grow up in different countries and, and are at the stage of where they're at in their career. But to actually find humour in the situation that we were in at the time was pretty cool. Uh, I mean, considering the political climate, considering Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, there was something kind of powerful about that in a very um, kind of calm. It was. It wasn't an ostentatious political statement, but it, it was uh, a touch pointed. I would have thought at the same time. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was unhistorical, which is mm. everything Morgan does is unhistorical, and it was measured and it was calm. And even in the the elation of victory, he was able to um, gently, but as you say, a touch pointedly make a make a very good observation about this side. I mean, England, you know, as you know, Britain is going through all kinds of uh, political upheaval. So for, for a, a multi-racial, multinational team, if you like, to lift the World Cup is uh, annoying for some people, shall mm. we say, and Jacob Rees-Mogg, probably among them, even though he tried to claim on Twitter that it was a, a victory for, that we didn't know it need anyone in Europe overlooking the fact that um, Owen Morgan was from Dublin. Yeah, it's kind of a spectacular moment from Jacob Bruce Brog, Mark, and he's had his fair share of them of late. Uh, you, you probably have dealt with Owen Morgan uh, far more than a lot of Irish journalists, to be honest. Uh, certainly over the last decade, you said there that that um, the lack of histrionics that's very much in keeping with his personality. How have you found him to deal with Lawrence? How, how would you how would you characterise him? You know, you've talked about advocating the attacking uh, cricket and going for broke, but as a person away from uh, the cricket field. I find him very straightforward. Um, he doesn't waste words. Uh, if, if, you're asked, if he's asked what he considers a daft question in the press conference, he'll, he'll give it short shrift, but not, not rudely. He'll be, he'll be straight to the point. Uh, he was asked after England lost Australia in the group game by an Australian journalist whether um, England had a World Cup, sort of, uh, the, 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 they regarded Australia as a World Cup bogey team, and he, he said no, and the Australian journalist said, why not? And he said, "Well, I've only played them twice in the last twenty-seven years. So it's, it's got to do with me." You know, he's he, he's to the point. He doesn't he doesn't suffer fools, but he's he's not rude. Um, I enjoy his his directness, uh, which again is probably isn't a very English quality, uh, and has, has actually worked well with this team because they regard him very much as a as a father figure, mm. uh, and they they listen, they hang on his every word, and they fully respect him. I mean, he hit seventeen sixes in that game against Afghanistan. That was a world record, mm. and though he didn't have the best tournament with the bat necessarily mm. that was the kind of performance he could pull out just to remind the team that you know he may be he may be one of the older members but he can still hack it when it comes to, to clearing the road nice very interesting i i didn't realize he was held in such regard and had that stature within the team uh, it's it's very interesting so i presume with the 2020 world cup next year his captaincy will continue well it's up to him um you know that's not absolutely set in stone he may decide to go out on on, on the top and who, who could blame him um, you know there's no guarantee they'll win the world T20 England haven't been quite as proficient at that as they have been at 50 over cricket he can make a good buck himself now by travelling the world playing T20 franchises he played in a T10 tournament even would you believe in, in the UAE so he, he said he's going to have to go away and think about that um, now often when a sportsman says that he's, he, the alarm bells start to ring and mm. you think well that's code for 
uh, I don't want to tell you now, but I will be going. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, if he went out now, no one would begrudge him that, and his his um, his reputation would be guaranteed forever. We're talking here with Lawrence Booth, uh, who writes all things cricket for the Daily Mail. Just one kind of broad area I wanted to touch on, which uh, Lawrence, it, it it certainly struck me from afar as. Uh, unusual that uh, a Serb against a Swiss on centre court uh, drew a higher peak audience than England winning the Cricket World Cup. Uh, what is cricket's place in English society? You know, like I know, like the Neville brothers and stuff played cricket, and it, it, it's not just the preserve of the elite. But we, I, I suppose it's, it leans in that direction. Like, can you give us a sense of uh, cricket in the English sporting landscape in 2019? Yeah, good question. I mean, you know, what, what you alluded to there it was an interesting one because, of course, Sky, who have, have had the rights for, for English home cricket since 2006, so there's been no live terrestrial cricket coverage since the 2005 Ashes, which was balmy timing, as you can imagine, yeah. um, shared coverage of the final with Channel 4. Now, that, that was a brave decision because, of course, the figures for Channel 4 dwarfed what Sky were going to get. Um, and I wish they hadn't scheduled the World Cup final for the, the same day as the Wimbledon final because goodness knows how many millions would have would have tuned into the cricket anyway. Yeah. I mean, it, that, that's a long-winded way of saying that cricket isn't quite where it should be, in my view. I'm biased. I think it's the best sport in the world. Um, it, and it's, it's England's summer sport. You know, it should be, it should be hogging the pages um, every day throughout the summer when the football season isn't on. Yeah. The problem has been, I think, that it's been hidden behind a satellite paywall since, since 2006 and people haven't just been able to tune into it um, casually, as we probably all did as kids with the sports we loved. Um, and you could see that with the viewing figures that came through Channel 4, so they had about 5 million watching it, um, in a total out of 8.3 million, something like that. So they contributed hugely to that audience. It, there, is a, there is a latent affection for cricket in this country, but it needs to be refreshed on a regular basis. Mm. You know, People need to be able to tune into it for the big events. Um, the worry now, of course, is that it disappears back behind a satellite paywall. At least England does. Yeah. Some county games next summer will be on the BBC. Um, and, the, you know, the, the feel-good factor of the last few days uh, dissipates and we go back to where we were. But who knows? I mean, if, you know, if we, don't, if we don't fall in love with cricket again after what happened on Sunday, then we don't deserve cricket. Yeah. And is there any way to know, have participation rates declined post-2005, post-the paywall decision? Yeah, they've been declining steadily, uh, especially since, uh, the, the, the paywall decision. I mean, they're going to try and use this. Obviously, the ECB, England Wales Cricket Board are going to try and use this as a, as a springboard to get to get kids into used again. Um, they've got a World Cup trophy to carry around the country now and show to people and, and get kids uh, excited that way. I was at the Oval yesterday where the, the team all thoroughly hung over, turned up with the World Cup trophy. School kids were let in for free. The public filled out the pavilion stands. And they interacted with the people, and it felt like what a, a proper sport should be. And I don't think it's been like that in England since 2005. Uh, Sunday was the first day since then where I felt it's truly a sport of the people and not just of the people who could afford a, a, a Sky subscription. Mm. Were any of the royal family at the cricket? I don't think they were. Uh, Prince Harry sent a, uh, a good luck message in advance, and the Queen, uh, I think, tweeted or... Uh, one of her I wouldn't say she tweeted. did, Lawrence. <laughs> no, she, her, her gloved fingers probably didn't touch the keyboard or her I think phone, so. whatever it was. But um, so there, there were congratulatory messages. The royal family aren't a big cricketing family. No, because they're, they're, they're all over at Wimbledon. Well, the, probably there is the royal box there, and of course the Queen prefers you know Royal Ascot. Um, so Prince Philip, I think, quite likes cricket, and Prince Charles is the patron of Surrey, but they they're kind of nominal right. roles, really. Um, uh, I mean. Yeah, they sent good luck messages, but beyond that, they probably probably didn't uh, didn't resonate greatly in Buckingham Palace. Right, I won't worry too much either way. <laughs> um, listen, I'm I'm glad we could lend your own Morgan to get you boys over the line. You're very welcome. Absolutely, <laughs> we're very grateful forever. Uh, Lawrence Booth, uh, cricket writer for the Daily Mail. Thanks so much, Lawrence. Great discussion. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Cheers.